Luke chapter 24. Hey, some context so that we just don't dive into this text and we're like, where in the world are we? Because we're going to start in verse 13. So we're going to start in the middle of this chapter. But Luke chapter 24, just to give some context. Okay, Jesus, you all know who Jesus is? Really, really amazing guy. Okay. Um, Not only amazing guy, but God in flesh. Jesus, he has been crucified by the Romans. He was buried in a tomb for three days, and three days later, he rose from the dead. That's the context of this passage. Jesus died for the sin of the world, crucified by the Romans, given up, betrayed by the religious leaders of his own Jewish people, crucified, buried, three days later, rose from the dead, all right? Verse 13. Verse 13, it says, now behold, Two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. Now, who are the two of them? Well, these are two of Jesus' followers. Now, they are not two of the original 12 disciples. Jesus had his close 12, but these two, we do know that they're followers of Jesus. If you want to glance real quickly down to verse 22, it says these guys are walking with Jesus, all right? They don't know it's Jesus, and they're describing to Jesus about who Jesus was, not knowing that they're actually talking to Jesus. And in verse 22, they say, yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. So they're saying these two women who went to the tomb, they were a part of our group, they're part of our company. We were followers of Jesus. So we know that these two guys walking along this road, they're followers of Jesus. So 13 says, now behold, two of them, two of these followers of Jesus, they were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was gonna redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. And when they didn't find his body, they came saying that they'd also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Verse 25, and then Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And so beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful to be in your house tonight. I'm so glad to be with my brothers and sisters. We just pray that now you would open up our hearts to hear from you tonight, Lord. You're, you be the teacher, God. Um, we thank you, God, for the opportunity that we get tonight and every Monday night just to study your word, to fellowship with other believers. And so all of, it, all of this is for you, Lord, all to your glory. Now we just pray that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you open up our hearts to hear from you and to receive what you have for us tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, so let's walk through these verses together. Again, the context is Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again, and then verse 13, now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. So again, there's these two guys, followers of Jesus, not of the original 12, but followers of Jesus nonetheless, and they are traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and the Bible says that that was a seven mile walk. Now that's a, that's a good, that's a long walk. So they have time to talk. And it says they're going from Jerusalem to a village called Emmaus. Now get this, the Greek word Emmaus means warm baths. 
Guys, that's my kind of village. <laughs> a village of warm baths, all right? You know, that was probably TMI, but uh, the village of warm baths, I mean, that's, that just sounds like a village you wanna go to and visit and hang out. You know, I wanna go to a village that's full of warm baths. All right, this is getting a little bit weird now, but we talked about baths a few weeks ago, and if you remember it, um, let's just say if you weren't here, it's probably better you weren't. <laughs> and so they're going to this village called Emmaus. It might have been their hometown, but it's a seven mile journey from Jerusalem. And they were probably going back home to Emmaus from the Passover celebration that was going on in Jerusalem. Now the Passover celebration, one of the largest Jewish feasts that was required for all Jewish men to journey to the city of Jerusalem, to the capital city of Jerusalem, and there were probably millions of Jewish people celebrating the Passover feast. And so there's this big party, big celebration in Jerusalem. Jesus was crucified on Passover. So millions of Jews in the city of Jerusalem celebrating the feast called Passover. Big party, big celebration, big feast, all the families getting together, eating, breaking bread together, having a good time. These two men, we're at the big party called Passover. Jesus, their, their guy, their, their followers of Jesus, he was just crucified. And now there's this rumor going around that this Jesus guy who was crucified, he rose from the dead. And they're going from Jerusalem, from this big party, all discouraged and sad because of this bad news. Okay, because they don't believe the rumor that he's alive. So Jesus, their hopeful Messiah is now dead. They're leaving this big party, having a seven mile journey back to their home in Emmaus, and they're talking about these things. And it says in verse 14, now what were the things they were talking about in verse 14? And they talked about, they talked together of all these things which had happened. What are all these things that had happened? Well again, big party happened in Jerusalem and some drama goes down. All right, their master Jesus was just crucified. You know when you've like been to a, like a big like birthday party, get together, big celebration, some, something big happens, like let's say like an engagement, and that's kind of like this, the, someone proposes at the big party you're at, and now that's just the talk of the party, and you drive off, maybe you and your bestie, you're driving back home and you're having a conversation, it's a long ride home, and you're like, can you believe Jessica and Bobby, they got engaged? I mean, I just, they are just so incompatible. I don't, like have you seen Bobby? He's a slob. Just he, his big belly's always hanging out of his shirt. Just gross, dude. Like, like they're just they're 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 not gonna last. They're gonna get divorced. So they're kind of this having this bestie conversation. They're discouraged. They're sad. They're all upset. This is what's happening. Two best friends walking from the party, talking about the drama of Jerusalem. So they're they're talking about all these things that just happened. Jesus, this guy that we thought was the the Messiah crucified so they're having this dialogue and then it says in verse 15 so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them 16 but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him and he said to them what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad so he notices that they're discouraged and then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened here in the last three days? So they're like, dude, have you like been hiding under a rock? Like, have you not been here knowing what's been going on? This is like the biggest news of the city, the capital city of Jerusalem. And so he, Jesus asked them in verse 19, he says to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. So these guys, they're walking with Jesus. The Bible says they don't recognize him to be Jesus. It says that their eyes were restrained and they did not know him. And has, has that ever happened to you where you've like gone up to someone and just totally, totally mistook them for, for someone else? Like you just didn't recognize them. It was a couple years ago. It was actually in the old church building. I, I was in the old church building and there was this long hallway and I saw my mom and my mom was talking with a couple, couple uh, like a group of her, of her friends. And so I started walking down the hallway and I'm really close to my mom, I'm kind of a mama's boy. And so I, I 
put, you know, my mom's back is, is to me, so I put both my arms uh, around my mom, I kind of squeeze her, I give her a little shake, I give her a kiss on the cheek, and then my mom turns around, and it wasn't my mom. <laughs> and I actually knew the lady, her name was Sue, she was a super sweet lady, and I was like, Miss Sue, <laughs> baby, I am so sorry, I thought you were my mom. And she was like, it's okay, baby, it's all good. No, she didn't say that. She was like, um, t take a step back before I, I call the police. Um, no, she was super sweet about it, but it was kind of one of those moments where like, I literally thought it was my mom, turned around, it wasn't my mom, and um, I, I, I went home and I just sobbed, I weeped. I wept, and uh, so this is, this is these two guys, they're walking with Jesus, someone that they knew, someone they were very familiar with, someone they probably had dinner with, had meals with, had shared laughs with, walking with Jesus, and they completely don't recognize him. Now, why is that? Why is it, how is it that they are walking with Jesus, someone that they were followers of, probably had good fellowship with, and yet they don't even recognize him? Well, it's interesting here in the New King James Version, that's the version I'm reading out of, it says that their eyes were restrained. The NIV says they were kept from recognizing him. That's what the ESV also says. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. The New Living Translation goes as far as to say, but God kept them from recognizing him. Now, why is that? Was it God preventing them from recognizing Jesus, or was it they themselves who didn't recognize Jesus? Well, it, it, the answer probably is yes, both. Now, why would Jesus do that? How would Jesus do, why would God do that rather? Sometimes God uses what one has already allowed in their hearts. I'll say that again. Sometimes God uses what one has already allowed in their hearts. We see this in scripture in the book of Exodus. Pharaoh is being stubborn in allowing the Hebrew people to leave their slavery. And the Bible says that God actually hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now that seems unfair. Like why would God violate Pharaoh's freedom like that? Well the answer is God didn't violate Pharaoh's freedom because five times in that same passage in the book of Exodus, it said that Pharaoh actually hardened his own heart. So Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and then God allowed what Pharaoh had already allowed into his own heart, God allowed that to fester. God hardened Pharaoh's own heart after Pharaoh had already chosen to harden his heart. And so here, these two disciples, disciples, followers of Jesus, they have no expectation of ever seeing Jesus again. They're defeated, and so God plays along with that. God keeps them from recognizing Jesus because they have already allowed in their own hearts to decide, I'm never gonna see Jesus again. And so these two guys walking with Jesus, having conversation with Jesus, don't recognize it to be Jesus, so they start describing to Jesus who Jesus was. And so their description of Jesus here in the next few verses actually tells us why their hearts didn't recognize him. Look at verse 19. So they start to describe Jesus to Jesus, not knowing it's Jesus in verse 19. So they said to him, well, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. So number one, why did they not recognize Jesus? Why didn't they recognize Jesus? Number one, they had a low view of his person. Oh, he's just a prophet. Did you catch that? Verse 19, they're describing Jesus to Jesus and Jesus is like, well, who was this guy? And they say, well, he was a good prophet. He was just a good prophet. So they had a low view of his person. Many religions today, Muslim religion, they, they just believe Jesus was a good prophet. Mormons, they just believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They don't believe that Jesus was actually God in flesh. Many people share low views of who Jesus is. These guys here, they admit that, well, Jesus, he was just a prophet. They weren't able to recognize Jesus for who he was, number one, because they had a low view of his person. But we know that Jesus was much more than a prophet. 
He actually made these exclusive claims. He actually said in the book of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. Jesus actually claimed to be God in John 14, 9. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Now the word one in the Greek, it's the Greek word hen, H-E-N, and it means to be one in essence and nature. So Jesus is much more than a prophet, but these two guys, they had a low view of his person. Well, this guy, Jesus, he was just a prophet. Verse 21, they go on to, and continue to describe who Jesus was. Verse 21, they say, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today's the third day since these things happened. So number one, they had a low view of his person, but number two, they also had a low expectation of his power. They say, this, this was the guy that we thought was going to redeem Israel. They had a low expectation of his power. This is the guy that I thought was going to redeem us from our oppression, but I guess not. I guess he didn't really have all the authority that he claimed. You see, in their Jewish eyes, in the Jewish perspective of that day, they thought Messiah was going to free them from their political oppression, from the Romans. So they had a low expectation of his power. Jesus said, I, I came to do so much more than free you from your political oppression from the Romans. I came to free you from your oppression of sin. Not just the, Israel, the Israelite people, but the whole world. Because there's a greater oppression than your political oppression. It's the oppression of sin and death that has hold of you. And I came to free you from that. So they had a low view of his power and what he came to do. They go on to describe in verse 22, yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. So when they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. They basically, yeah, sure, the, the women went to this empty tomb, but they didn't see Jesus. Jesus wasn't there. Why didn't they recognize Jesus? Number three, they had little belief in his promises. If you actually read throughout the Gospels, do you know how many times Jesus actually told his 12 disciples, clear as day, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be risen back to life in three days? He told them that several times, but they had little belief in his promises. And in verses 25 through 27, this is when Jesus responds. He says to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the things that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And so beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus talks to them. He says, you guys are so slow to believe all that was promised about me. And he goes on from Moses, all through the prophets, and he quotes the Old Testament, talking about the promises of his coming. He probably quoted Isaiah 53 for, I was pierced for your transgressions, crushed for your iniquities. The punishment that brought you peace was upon me, Isaiah 53. Probably quotes from Psalm 16, that the Holy One will not rot in corruption. Goes throughout the whole Old Testament, talks about these promises, but you see, they had little belief in his promises. Yeah, the tomb was empty, but they didn't see Jesus. Body could have been stolen. We don't know what happened. So they have little belief in his promises. And listen, when you have low view of his person, when you have little expectation for his power, and you have little view of his promises and little belief of his promises, you too will walk discouraged in life and be spiritually blind to what God actually wants to do in your life. These guys are walking with Jesus, describing to Jesus who Jesus was all about, and they have a low view of his person, low expectation of his power, and little belief in his promises, and they're discouraged and Jesus notices it. And they're spiritually blind, they don't recognize him. And you might be here at Young Adults tonight, how does this apply to us? You might be here and you would say, you know, Austin, I kind of feel, I feel discouraged in my walk with the Lord. 
You might say, yeah, I feel spiritually blind. I, I don't see what God is doing in my life. I don't see God's hand moving. I can't recognize God. When I read my Bible, I really don't understand it. Feel hopeless. Don't really understand my purpose. Don't really understand uh, what God wants for me. Don't really understand my gifts and how God wants to use me. Just feel kind of apathetic in my walk with the Lord. You see, because these, these two guys, they were literally walking with Jesus. They didn't recognize him because of these three things. And in our walks with Christ, you know, that's why we call it a walk with Christ, because these guys were literally walking with the Lord. We, we figuratively walk with Jesus in our relationship with him. And sometimes we can often be discouraged in our walk with him. Don't recognize his hand moving. Don't really have much discernment, much wisdom. Don't, uh, don't really have any passion to read the Bible. Really feel apathetic, can't get in the word, can't read my Bible. Listen guys, I'm not here to say that that's not me. That's been me many times in my walk with the Lord. Been discouraged in my walk with the Lord. Just been apathetic. Uh, don't really have a motivation or a drive to read my Bible. Really, just I don't understand it sometimes. And so I feel spiritually blind. Even though I'm walking with Jesus, really just don't understand or recognize uh, what God is up to in my life. And so there is a remedy. And I want you to be encouraged tonight. These these. These guys, their eyes will be open to who Jesus is. And we see, we're gonna see why, if you keep reading with me. These guys, the, the eyes of these guys are gonna be open in verse 28. What's the remedy? Let's check it out, verse 28. So, then they drew near to the village where they were going, and Jesus indicated that he would have gone farther. So there comes a point in this journey, guys are coming close to Emmaus. Jesus says, hey, I gotta go a different way. And it says in verse 29, but they constrained him saying, abide with us for it's toward evening and the day is far spent. And so he went to stay with them. And so they're walking with Jesus here. And it says that they constrained him after Jesus says, listen, I got to go my own way. They constrained him. It's the Greek word para beotsomai. And it's a strong word that means to compel by force. All right, so it's not like they beat Jesus up, but just imagine Jesus says, hey, I gotta go my own way now. And these two guys, after Jesus opens the scriptures up to them, these two guys compel him by force. Maybe they grab him by the arm, put their arm around his shoulder, grab his arm, grab his hand, grab his shirt. No, come, Jesus, it's late. Come with us, stay with us. So imagine this with me. Two of these guys, they're, after Jesus spends time talking about scripture with them, these two guys are passionate about staying in the presence of Jesus. They're like, come with us, stay. They were desperate for Jesus' company. So number one, what is the remedy to discouragement in the life of the believer? What is the remedy to spiritual blindness? Well, number one, it is as simple as time in the word. Time in the word. It was only until these, these guys only were desperate to be in Jesus' company only after Jesus opened up the scriptures with them. They were desperate to be in Jesus' company after Jesus had talked about the Bible with them. Time in the Word, verse 27, it says, and at the beginning of Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded, expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so after that point, Jesus says, hey, I gotta, I gotta leave. And they say, no, come with us. Stay with us. They're passionate about Jesus' presence. Listen, you will only become desperate about spending time with Jesus until you recognize your true dependence upon him. And you will only recognize your true dependence and need for Jesus the more time you spend with him in his word. We become so apathetic and lazy in our walks with the Lord because we don't spend enough time with Him. Guys, it's, this is ABC. How do you cultivate romantic relationships? How do you cultivate your engagement, your, your marriage? How do you cultivate just simple friendships? You spend more time with the ones you love. You get to know them. And the way you get to know God is you read God's book and you get in His Word and you cultivate that relationship with Him. 
And the more you spend in his word, even though you don't always understand all of the passages, all of the verses, the more you spend time in his word and you're just vulnerable and honest with the Lord and say, Lord, I don't understand what I'm reading today, but I ask that by your Holy Spirit, you speak to me. I wanna spend time with you, reveal yourself to me. The Lord will show up, he will. The Bible says that the one who seeks me with all their heart, I will be found by him. That's a promise from scripture. You can take it to the bank. And so the more you spend time with Jesus in his word, and yes, it might be boring, you don't understand it. Stick with it, discipline yourself. It's like being in the gym, working out. The more you do it, the more your body will begin to grow stronger. And the more you spend time with Jesus, your spiritual strength will grow. You grow by spending time in his word. You become passionate. Your apathy turns to zeal. The more you spend time with Jesus, So many times, I just read a verse. It's like, Lord, I'm not feeling it today. Close the book. And I'm like, why am I just, I'm not passionate about the things of the Lord. Get in the word, read it. And guys, I'm the first to say that there have been many days where I have gone without reading my Bible because I feel apathetic spiritually. And it could be a number of things. The spiritual warfare, Satan loves to discourage us as Christians and he keeps us from the source of living water because he knows that when we drink from water, we'll continue to grow and we'll thirst for more, but he keeps us from the well and then we go dry. And so spend time in the word, be disciplined about it. It was only until after Jesus spent time opening up the scriptures to them that then that passion to spend more time with Jesus grew. Stay with us. And so they bring Jesus. They bring Jesus and and the Bible says in verse 30, now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Verse 31, then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. So Jesus is walking with these guys, talking scripture with them. Go to, he goes to their house, they break bread and then it says their eyes were open. They recognized Jesus and it says he just vanished. He left their presence the supernatural glorified body of Jesus. Pretty amazing. And in verse 30, check this out. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, broke it, gave it to them. Their eyes were open, verse 32. And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us? Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? It says our hearts were literally on fire as he talked about the Bible with us. The Greek word for burn is the Greek word kaio, and it means to set on fire, to light, to consume with with fire. God's word can have that effect on your life and on your heart the more time you spend with him in his word. God will turn that apathy that we've all experienced, he will turn it into zeal. He will give you a passion for the things of the Lord. He will give you a passion for righteousness and holiness to walk in purity before him the more that you spend in his word. They say, weren't, they, they, they both looked at each other after Jesus disappeared. Weren't our hearts burning? <laughs> weren't our hearts on fire as he talked to us about the scriptures? They knew something is different about this guy. And then check this out, number two, Number one is time in his word. How how do you grow from just being discouraged in your walk with the Lord to encouraged and removing the spiritual blinders? So you gotta spend time in his word. But number two, check this out, we just read it. You have to fellowship at his table. Spend time in his word, but fellowship at his table. That's what it says in verse 32, or in verse 30, it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to him. And it was then that their eyes were opened and they knew him. So listen, as you spend time in God's word, yes, get in the word, read the Bible, allow God's word to set fire on your heart as he convicts you of sin, as he emboldens you, empowers you, strengthens you by the power of his Holy Spirit. That's the power of God's word. But listen, Jesus also stayed and he fellowshiped with them at their table. Now, how are these two points different? Well, they really overlap because the more time you fellowship with the Lord, it's spending time with his word. All right, but Paul also says in the book of 1 Corinthians, pray without ceasing. So this is the fellowship aspect of being with Jesus. You get in the word, but listen, you also pray without ceasing. Now, praying without ceasing, it literally means you're just having an ongoing conversation with the Lord throughout the day. 
just whatever it might be. Peter says in 1 Peter, he says, cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Give all your anxieties to the Lord. All throughout the day, whether you're at, your, you're at work, you're with family, there's tension, whatever it might be, you're at school taking classes, you're having anxiety, uh, give it to the Lord, commit it to him. But you don't, you, get out of this mindset that you have to set aside some religious obligation to get on your floor mat and to pray before the Lord um, with your hands folded and your eyes closed and your head bowed. All right, that's great. Set, a time, set aside time to do that. But just throughout the day, commit yourself to talking with the Lord, casting your cares upon Him throughout the day. As you're driving, put on worship music. Listen, I, I'm a big fan of music, but Satan uses all forms of media to pollute our minds throughout the day, to distract us throughout the day, to keep us disengaged. Fill your heart and your mind with worship music that praises the Lord. Um, it does a, a beautiful thing to your heart and your mind when you are listening to things, getting things into your heart and mind, uh, words that please the Lord, words that honor the Lord, words that worship the Lord. So turn on worship music, guys. This is a part of that fellowship with the Lord, fellowshipping at his table. Cease, uh, pray without ceasing, get in the word, journal, write out what's on your heart, write out what's on your mind, commit it to the Lord. Write down the different ways that the Lord has blessed you so you can look back on, on your week, on your day, and instead of having a, an attitude and a heart of just always complaining, you have a heart of gratitude towards the Lord. Thank you for the food you've given me, the car that works, the air conditioning in my home, all the simple stuff that we take for granted. Cultivate that attitude of, in your heart and your mind of just constantly just having communion with the Lord. Fellowship at his table, number two. And so if you have a low view of his person, low expectation of his power, little belief in his promises, listen, here's the remedy. So simple to say, harder to do sometimes. Dig into God's word with intentionality and he will open up your eyes to who he truly is, to his power, to his promises for your life. And in closing, I just want you to notice when their eyes have finally been opened, they recognize Jesus. Check out verse 33. It says, so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the 11. Now, th these are the 11 disciples. Remember that one dude who betrayed Jesus, hung himself? He's no longer there. There's no 12. It's just 11. So it says, they rose that hour, returned to Jerusalem, found the 11, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord is risen indeed. So if you caught that, they said the Lord has risen indeed. They had a high view of his person and a high view of his power. The Lord, it's the Greek word kurios, it literally means master. They're calling him master. They says he has risen indeed. They recognize his power. They recognize that the promises were fulfilled. So that's what happens after spending time with Jesus. After getting into his word, fellowshipping at his table, talking about Jesus with other believers, your view of Jesus grows, your expectation of Jesus and the power that he has, that he is God, that his promises are true and trustworthy and faithful, your dependence upon him only grows. That's these, these two guys, the Lord, he's risen indeed. He's appeared to Simon, it says in verse 33. In verse 35, it says, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. All right, so just to give a couple practical things as we close. What does it look like to get in the Word? Because listen, I, I, I hammer this principle time and time again. Get in the Word, get in the Word, get in your Bibles, read the Word. What does that practically look like? I just want to give you two, two simple ideas that I really want to challenge you just to put into practice. And, and I would love it in your small groups, share different ideas about uh, what you do and how you get in the Word two things that I love to do. One is, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you. This might start off difficult. Keep with it. Listen, read one chapter a day and write a one-sentence summary of what you just read. Read one chapter a day, and I'm going to challenge you. Go through the whole Bible. Start Genesis 1, end up in Revelation 22. Read one chapter a day and write a one sentence summary on what you just read. Listen, if you read four chapters a day 
If you read four chapters a day and you write one sentence on each chapter, you'll have read the Bible in a little less than one year. If you read two chapters a day, write one sentence on each chapter, you'll read the Bible in a little less than two years. And if you read four chapters a day, every day for a whole year, you write only, I'm, I'm only saying, one, keep it short, keep it short, write one sentence of the chapter you wrote. In one year, you'll have a whole commentary on the Bible. In one year. If, you, if that sounds too daunting, do two chapters. Two chapters a day, write one sentence. Write one sentence of each chapter. I mean, what, what else, should, in, in two years, I mean, in the grand scheme of your life, two years, you'll have read through the whole Bible and you'll have written one sentence on every single chapter in the Bible. That's one idea. If that sounds too daunting, here's another thing. Memorize one verse in one week. Memorize one, so you got, you got a whole week to memorize one Bible verse. And at the end of the year, you'll have memorized 52 verses. All right, that's probably 50 more than you know now. <laughs> I love you. Memorize one verse every week. And by the end of the year, you'll have 52 down. Just two ideas that I love in your small groups, talking with other believers, share your ideas. Those aren't the only two things. But what I love to do, especially why I love to write about scripture after I read scripture, is if I know that I have to write a one sentence summary on the chapter I just read, it keeps me focused. I get so distracted so easily. My mind wanders. I could, I've, I've read a lot of the Bible. I could easily read a passage of scripture. I'd be like, I know this story, I've read it before, and easily miss so many principles and truths because I just skim over it. I know it, but if I know that I have to write about it after I'm done, it keeps me focused, it keeps me engaged. So that's just me, it might not be you. But these are just some practical, helpful things. Get alone with God, get in the Word. Time in His Word will turn your discouraged hearts, your spiritual blindness, and the Lord will do such a work in your life. He'll do such a work in your heart. He will reveal Himself to you in ways you never expected and then fellowship at his table, get with other believers, talk about Jesus, spend time with Jesus, pray without ceasing, and just fellowship with the Lord. Build that relationship with him. Listen, Luke chapter 24 is often seen as a model of the journey that Jesus makes with many of us today. As he opens up our eyes, points us to his word, and reveals himself along life's walk, to be our Lord and Savior. And so let's pray, and I pray that, the, that that's what the Lord does in our own hearts. If there's any, any one of us tonight who has just been feeling spiritually apathetic, you just found it hard to get in the Word, to open up your Bible, you've just been discouraged, and maybe it's been a number of things. Maybe, you, maybe it's just the enemy that's coming against you. Um, I, I'm not saying that Satan's under every rock, but the enemy attempts to discourage us as believers. And so maybe, maybe you just feel like there's spiritual warfare going on, that, that Satan just right now has really just been discouraging you. Maybe for other reasons, you've just been distracted, distracted by just the worries or cares of the world. So you've just been discouraged. If you would be so bold and so vulnerable, would you just raise your hand? I just wanna know who to pray pray for tonight. Just raise your hand if you've just been feeling discouraged in your walk with the Lord. Lord, different hands raised all throughout the room tonight. Would you meet them where they are tonight, Lord? And would you open up their hearts? Would you open up our hearts, Lord? Would you open up our spiritual eyes to see you, to recognize that we're not alone, that you are walking with us, that you have so much for us, Lord? May you help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to spend time in your word, to fellowship with you, Lord, so that our, so that our apathy might turn into zeal. Our laziness might just turn into such a passion for you, Lord, that we might say, weren't our hearts burning with passion as we read our Bibles? By the power of your Spirit, would you do that, Lord? Would you open up our eyes to see you, to recognize your hand in our lives? Would you encourage those who are discouraged tonight, Lord? 
I pray by the power of your spirit, Lord, would you just comfort us tonight, encourage us in your word, help us to be disciplined, to really spend time with you, to cultivate our relationship with you by spending time with you, Lord, casting our cares upon you because you care for us, Lord. We can relate to these two guys, walking along the road, being discouraged, being sad, Lord, but we, we worship a risen Lord. We worship a Lord who has defeated sin and death, there is no reason, Lord, for us to walk hopeless in this life, joyless, Lord, for you are our joy, you are our hope, and may you fill us with your hope, Lord. May you fill us with your joy, the joy of our salvation, Lord. May we walk out of this room tonight, out of young adults, just feeling so refreshed and so rejuvenated, so on fire for you, Lord, disciplined to walk with you, to get to know you, open up our hearts and our eyes, Lord, to see you moving and working in our lives, to mature us and grow us and convict us of sin. Help us to repent and turn from sin, Lord, the stuff that doesn't honor you and please you, Lord, and help us to walk in righteousness, Lord. But give us that passion, Lord. Give us that zeal to follow you, Lord, that we might be like these two guys with hearts on fire for you, Lord. That's our prayer tonight, God. Only you can do it by the power of your spirit, Lord. Remove the veil from our eyes that we might recognize you and see you, Lord. Know you deeper. Know you more intimately, Lord. We love you, God, and we thank you that you, the God of the universe, want relationship with us, Lord. We love you, we praise you, we worship you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people together said, amen.